So I want to welcome everyone here tonight to a brand new start on, uh, we're going to be studying the book of Daniel and how it relates to, um, to Revelation. And um, so this ought to be, uh, ought to be a pretty good course. We're going to have uh, some, the texts that I'm going to be using uh, are really all over the place uh, from various Christian sources as well as from um, some mainline uh, Jewish course, uh, uh, sources that have uh, commented on, it's basically the book I've got for the Jewish sources is uh, one that uh, will be, uh, they, it has comments for the that you know last two thousand years or the, 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 as far back as they've got uh, comments for uh, for the book of uh, Daniel, so it ought to be ought to be fun. Let's go ahead and begin with the uh, blessing. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher Kitshanavim It's Fatav It's Ivan Olasok Bedivrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the Universe who sanctifies us with his commands and commands us to engross ourselves in the word of Torah. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so tonight we're starting out with the, uh, the book of Daniel. And what I anticipate on this, um, during this course, is that we will um, start uh, in Daniel, and then as we get into some of his prophecy that uh, that uh, he has that uh, we will um, we will uh, then uh, look at other places in the Bible you know where he has prophesied and then uh, we will uh, you know use those other sources in the Bible to uh, to verify what it is that uh, that Daniel uh, prophesied. So that means that um, um, uh, that means that um, you know we will be looking in, in uh, um, Revelation a good bit and that's that's kind of the way uh, I, the reason that I've, I've sourced this thing at, or uh, named this thing is Daniel the foundation of Revelation because you really need to know uh, Daniel and what he's talking about and his prophecies so that you can then uh, use that to uh, jump off into a revelation. So um, Michael asks, you know, am I using the art scroll commentary on, uh, on Daniel? And uh, yes, I am. That's the one I've got ordered. Um, and uh, it should be in Monday or Tuesday of this uh, this week, or I hope I hope it uh, it comes in very very soon. But yes, it is a I believe it is an art scroll um, ver, uh, art scroll commentary on Daniel. So uh, if if uh, Michael has that same commentary, then uh, um, he can read up on it and uh, know whether I'm uh, trying to fake you out or anything. Now, so. Let's go ahead and get into it. I uh, wanted to give some uh, historical background on this. And the book of the book of Daniel takes place uh, from um, 605 to 530 BCE, and that uh, basically that bridges both the Babylonian and the Persian uh, kingdoms' rule over Judea and uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Daniel follows uh, kind of a, a very, very turbulent period in in uh, Israel's history. You know where they uh, basically where they've uh, come under uh, Judah or uh, Jerusalem has come under um, the, uh, the domination of Babylon, and they they uh, have several um, times where Babylon comes in and uh, exiles some of the people. So um, they, uh, you know, Israel, the, you remember the northern kingdoms of Israel, um, that was uh, centered up, uh, up in uh, Dan and, and uh, that area. Um, 
they had been uh, taken into captivity uh, much earlier in uh, in uh, 722 BCE, uh, and that uh, they were taken by the Assyrians. Now. Um, that uh, you know this this area, if you if you're if you're familiar with the history and the geography of it, Israel and um, and uh, Judea, uh, both of those or Judah, uh, both of them, these countries, the northern and the southern kingdoms, were um, they're kind of right in the pathway of uh, of trade, commerce, uh, conquest, anything that's going from. Uh, the northern Middle East down into into Egypt, and so anytime that there's a uh, any kind of um, uh, conflict, well, it seems like all of the troops uh, would would go through uh, Israel. So uh, Israel is a very important time, uh, a very important place and city and uh, country, and uh, we know that um, Solomon had built uh, some pretty good fortifications. But now these uh, these things had been uh, torn down and uh, or in, in not into uh, uh, into use anymore. So um, this was all that so uh, what was going on. Babylon had been um, a, a kingdom that uh, it was uh, dominated by the Assyrian uh, Empire, and um, then in 621. Uh, BCE, um, Nabopolassar, or however you want to pronounce that one, became king of Babylon, and he challenged uh, Assyrian control. So in, uh, in 612, then, uh, uh, nine years uh, later, with the aid of the Medes and the, and the Scythians, uh, Nabopolassar uh, sacked the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. And then... Um, as as a result of that, you know, where he took over the the uh, capital, then Assyria uh, went into a, a quick decline, and um, uh, the the armies uh, of Assyria they abandoned the cities of of Haran, uh, and uh, then in six uh, six ten B C E, uh, Egypt allied itself with Assyria against Babylon to, to, uh, to retake the city. And Pharaoh, uh, the Pharaoh named uh, Necho, N-E-C-O, uh, and you'll see that in 2 Kings 23, uh, 28 through 30, uh, he uh, was on his way through Israel, was intercepted by the armies of Judah, led by Josiah, the, the king, and uh, Josiah was killed in battle, and Assyria then became part of the... Uh, um, Neo-Babylonian Empire. Um, so, uh, um, uh, Jehoaz, uh, Josiah's second con uh, son, was installed in his father's place. He ruled only for three months until the Pharaoh uh, then returned from Haran. Uh, Jehoaz uh, was taken as a captive to Egypt and was replaced by his uh, his brother uh, Eliakim, who uh, we we know as uh, Jehoiakim, and uh, he um, he reigned for about ten years, six hundred eight to uh, five ninety eight BC, um, and Judah became kind of a vassal of uh, of um, Egypt. Then. Uh, uh, you know, in 605, Egypt was trying to to take over what remained of the of the Assyrian uh, Empire down in that part of the of the world, and they uh, they fought against uh, Babylon at the Battle of Carchemish, and uh, that uh, uh, in that battle, uh, Egypt was was pretty well soundly uh, defeated, and uh, that was the end of of, of Egyptian. Uh, conquest and Egyptian attempts to to um, take over the the Middle East. Uh, then uh, Nebuchadnezzar, on his way back from this this battle uh, against Egypt, uh, he he went by uh, Jerusalem 
and uh, uh, he took hostages. He looted the treasures from the temple, and uh, the uh, when he took all the hostages, well, then Jerusalem surrendered, and uh, a lot of the people that were that uh, were taken were, you know, the uh, the hero of our story here, Daniel, and uh, uh, three Hebrew. Um, young men, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You may know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, these were some uh, descendants of the royal families in, in some way. Um, now, you, you remember that in this, in this time frame, right before, before Daniel, that, the, that Josiah... Uh, you know, this is this is important uh, because it kind of sets the stage up for for Daniel and and why he was who he was. Uh, Josiah's reign was from 640 to, um, or that he lived from uh, 640 to 609. Was um, um, that's another important event in the in the history of Judah. Um, under Josiah, Israel experienced a physical a spiritual revival. Josiah was the great grandson of Hezekiah, and uh, Hezekiah's son Manasseh and Manasseh's son Ammon, uh, Josiah's father. They were uh, they were not good kings. They led Israel into or uh, uh, Judah into a time of apostasy, and so they they turned away from God. And uh, but uh, somehow, I mean, you just think of it, incredible here. Josiah was different, and he wanted to do God's will. Josiah came to power as the king of Judah when he was only eight years old. Imagine uh, an eighteen or an eight-year-old kid as the king of the country, and um, you know here he was. His father and his grandfather before him were uh, no accounts, and they led Israel into apostasy, idolatry, all sorts of bad stuff. And here he is, eight years old, and he says, no, that's not right. We're going to do what God uh, had commanded us to do. Ten years later then, at, when he was 18 years old, um, the priest Hilkiah uh, found the book of the law in the temple. And so um, Josiah reinstituted the covenant, celebrating a national Passover, destroying all sorts of idol worship, and... Um, we know that Jeremiah the prophet was a, a, a contemporary of of uh, Josiah, uh, who was uh, who was uh, twenty one um, when Josiah was twenty one when God first spoke to him. Um, Jeremiah uh, served with King Josiah until Josiah's death in six hundred nine, and um, it said that uh, you know Jeremiah wept for his friend and king who died at 39 years of age. Uh, there's another contemporary of uh, Josiah, and uh, that was uh, Josiah and Jeremiah, and that was Ezekiel. Um, and he was like uh, 30, 31 years old in, in 597. So he, along with uh, Jeremiah, Daniel, and, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they... They all benefited from the Josiah's revival, and it it put them in a light that um, you know probably they would not have been in had there not been a, a national revival. Because uh, uh, these guys were very zealous for the law and uh, zealous for uh, doing um, doing what the law required, what God required of them. So we see in Daniel that um you know that his his life his demeanor everything that he did in babylon and later on in persia is a product of the revival of the days of josiah so you just never know when um you know revival uh takes place or uh your influence on someone uh that uh, you wouldn't even think of uh josiah um, and you know his his uh, uh, pursuit of godliness, then that would have affected a whole generation of people 
that um, that then uh, they were very instrumental in uh, Bible history. So uh, said Daniel was a contemporary of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and all three of them were in Jerusalem when Daniel and his uh, friends were taken uh, into captivity in Babylon. So uh, in 605, Daniel was uh, probably 14 to 15 years of age. Um, and, um, you know, so um, Jeremiah was, he was in his 22nd year of ministry uh, being, you know, he was, he was around 14 years old when he was called. So that would make him about, uh, make um, Jeremiah about 36 years of age when the, uh, the captivity took uh, uh, place. Um, and um, Ezekiel was, uh, um, let's see, he was 30 in 597 B.C., so that would make him uh, 22 years old in uh, 605. So uh, you'd got um, uh, Daniel, when they were taken into captivity, Daniel was uh, 14 or 15, Ezekiel was 22, and then Jeremiah was the old man at at thirty six at that point, and uh, Dan, uh, Michael has a as a comment here. Daniel was taken to Babylon at fifteen years of age. He was thought to be a member of the royal family of Jude, uh, Judea. Uh, he's a royal prince, though not in the lineage of succession. His overall attitude to his own captivity is one of acceptance because of God's judgment against uh, Judea. His acceptance into the Babylonian Imperial Academy suggested uh, Daniel was not a member of the Judean insurgency movement, but was possibly a realist and therefore uh, pro-Babylonian. So, and I think uh, there were some of, uh, uh, you know, that if you look at Josiah, uh, one of the reasons that he went out and fought against, um, against uh, Egypt was um, that he, he was trying to play both ends against the middle. And so he would have been uh, probably possibly pro uh pro-Babylon uh, also. So anyway, just going through our, our talking points here, uh, we know that 620, thereabout, Daniel was born. And then uh, in 605, uh, Jerusalem falls to Babylon and Daniel is taken into Babylon. And then we know that uh, then at another uh, siege by Babylon the uh, on the uh, 9th of Av, that uh, the temple was destroyed in 586. So going on, uh, I got some pictures here. I, I, I like to have pictures. I like maps and stuff. So here is the Assyrian Empire, uh, you know, where it, uh, it first started out in the dark green uh, areas. And um, uh, so we see th this area here. That's the the uh, beginnings of the Assyrian Empire, and then the Assyrian Empire uh, at its uh, at its final uh, or its its largest it, at its apogee, I guess, at its biggest point. So um, that was the uh, Assyrian Empire, and then we remember that uh, then uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Or, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's father, anyway, uh, went against Nineveh and captured uh, Nineveh. And um, then uh, the, the Assyrian Empire kind of folded. And then we have the Babylonian Empire. So you see here that the Babylonian Empire is largely the same thing, as, or same territory. You, know, you look at that, look at this. Uh, you know, back to it. Okay, the Babylonian Empire probably a little bit bigger than the um, than the uh, Assyrian Empire, but uh, that was it. Took up most of the uh, the near Middle East. Uh, so here we go. Um, so who is who is Daniel? Now his name, uh, if you look at it in Hebrew, Dalit Nun Yod Aleph and uh, Lamed, uh, it's 
it would be Daniel, uh, meaning that God is my judge. The L on the end is God. So it's God is my judge. And uh, we don't know um, anything about who his parents were or where he was born. But according to rabbinical tradition, Daniel was of royal descent. Uh, and uh, um, his fate, along with his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were uh, foretold uh, by the prophet Isaiah to King Hezekiah in these words. And, uh, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And that's in Isaiah 39 and 7. So I always thought that when, you know, when I read, when I read the, uh, um, the bit on um, Hezekiah, you know, where uh, he was told that this was, this was told um, to him by Isaiah that uh, this is what was going to happen to Jerusalem. And, uh, and his words were, well, that's good because now I'm going to have peace in my time. So he was, uh, you know, he's like a lot of politicians. You know, it didn't really matter what was going to happen later on. He was just going to kick the can right down the road. And, uh, um, you know, he didn't care as long as he had peace when, when he was in power. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of who Daniel, that's what we know about Daniel. Now, the book itself, um, it was... Uh, the, the date of writing, if you, it depends on who you ask as to um, when it was, when it was uh, written. Because some will say, you know, some of the, the critics of, of Daniel will say that it was uh, written in the 2nd century BCE, sometime during the uh, uh, Maccabean time. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, then... You know, but they say that because they said, well, there's problems with the language, uh, that he was using Greek words, and how would a guy up there know uh, uh, Greek words? Well, uh, there were many, many Greek mercenaries uh, fighting for the Babylonians, so Daniel would certainly have known uh, uh, some Greek words that he would have used or borrowed for his, his writings. And uh, the critics, they just can't get over the, the idea that uh, uh, God works and there are actually um, supernatural things, supernatural knowledge that uh, is, you know, that's out there and that there's really a God. So these guys that look at the second century, uh, an authorship in the second century, they say, well, he just wrote it. He was writing... Uh, uh, he was a historian and not a prophet because uh, he he was already uh, in the Maccabean period, uh, and that's that's when he wrote it. But then uh, I think that has been um, it it has been kind of refuted uh, in later years because of of uh, the archaeology. They're finding uh, things that that show that Daniel was actually, you know, he was a real person and he actually uh, uh, did uh, write the book uh, around the, in the sixth, uh, in the sixth century toward the end of his life. So, uh, and we look at the, uh, the language of, of um, Daniel. Um, I, I did want to mention though that, uh, let's see, uh, we'll, we'll get into the language of, of uh, Daniel is um, um, the from it's in Hebrew from chapter one uh, one to uh, two and two four that's all in Hebrew and then the chapters eight and uh, through twelve they're all in Hebrew the middle part from two four to uh, seven twenty eight is in Aramaic. Now, Aramaic, um, we also know that uh, you know there's Aramaic in uh, in Ezra in a couple of places, and also in uh, Jeremiah. And Aramaic and uh, is is a, a language that um, it, it was kind of the lingua franca of of the Middle East uh, back in those days. 
and even to the point uh, there, you know, uh, Yeshua spoke Aramaic. Uh, it was the the common language of of the people um, uh, back then. So it would not have been uncommon for him to use um, use that. So, so why did Daniel compose a portion of his revelation in uh, in a foreign language? Um, so we know that Aramaic was, in fact, the common language in the sixth century BCE, and uh, but not in the Maccabean period. Because once you get to the Maccabean period, who was in charge uh, back in those days? Uh, Alexander the Great had already come through and uh, required everybody to uh, speak uh, Greek. So um, by the time that that book of Daniel would have been written. If it, if indeed it was written in the in the second century BCE, it would have been written in Greek and not in Aramaic. But um, Daniel's message was not only to the Jewish people but to the nations. So uh, Aramaic in Daniel's day is equivalent to English in our day. It's the it's the the, the predominant language of the world, and uh, so uh, when he was speaking of the uh, I think I've got it in a later slide. Um, yeah, down here, the, the Hebrew passages uh, pertain to Israel's interests, and the Aramaic passages then uh, deal more with uh, international issues that, uh, uh, you know, his, his prophecies to the nation that, um, um, that he would use Aramaic, because then it would have a wider uh, distribution. Uh, we see the the same thing when people argue uh, today over the language of the New Testament. There are there are those that argue that the New Testament was written in uh, Hebrew first and then translated into Greek later. But there's actually no physical evidence of that. There's no scrolls that. Um, that point that out, so uh, or that that would prove that uh, that theory. And uh, really, when you get right down to it, if God was trying to get his uh, his story out, uh, the the uh, good news out to uh, the world, how would he get it out there? Uh, but by the language that was common to all the world, so that everyone could uh, could read it. So. Um, we look at how how Daniel is divided up. There's a couple of ways that actually you could you could uh, look at it being divided up, um, and like the first six chapters were more historical, and they just tell a story, as it were, of uh, of events that happened to Daniel, and then the uh, the chapters seven through twelve were more prophetic in nature, and that's where you see Daniel's visions and uh, so forth. So where where does Daniel fit in the Bible? Now, in the Jewish Bible, you know, we know that the Jewish Bible is, is uh, divided into three sections, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, so Daniel, in the Hebrew Bible, Daniel is included in the third section uh, uh, known, you know, as the writings or uh, ketuvim, um, and then there's uh, there's uh, I think a Greek word uh, uh, that's uh, the hagiographa, and um, um, so he was placed in there. Now, why uh, why do you think that uh, Daniel would be placed in the writings and not in the prophets? Uh, you know, uh, because if you go to the Christian side of things, then we place uh, we see that uh, that the Christians have placed him in uh, the major prophet category. They look at uh, uh, I think in the Septuagint and the Vulgate uh, Vulgate um, um, translations. Uh, Daniel is placed with the major prophets, and um, um, Josephus also includes uh, Daniel in the, the prophets section of, uh, of Jewish canon. 
So the reason that Daniel is placed in the Ketuvim, uh, the writings, is n not because Daniel is considered less inspired than the prophets, uh, but Daniel is in the third division because Daniel was not called a Nabi or a or a prophet. He was not ordained as a prophet like a, a, a Jeremiah or Ezekiel um, uh, were. Um, so he's seen as what they call a Jose, a seer, or a Hakam, a wise man. Uh, the second uh, section of the of the Hebrew writings, you know, the uh, the prophets was uh, reserved only for those that were addressed as as uh, prophets, and uh, the the third division is not considered less inspired because I mean it's got the Psalms, Proverbs, Chronicles, etc. Um, David is a prophet and his writings inspired, but but Psalms is placed in the third division, the same as as Daniel. So. Um, what was the uh, um, let's go ahead with what was the purpose of um, writing in Daniel? Um, the purpose of it was to encourage people. Uh, again, when he was talking to his uh, his Jewish counterparts, his Israelite counterparts, it was to encourage the people that. Uh, I think it, and it shows to tell them that, okay, no matter what happens, God is in control. I think this is important to us today to look at because we got some stuff going on in, in uh, our world and in our political system right now that uh, um, just, you know, it would make you want to pull your hair out. Um, but we have to go back to looking at the Bible and looking at what Daniel is telling us here, that, that no matter what, God is still in control. He's got everything. You know, it's like that old uh, song. He's got the whole world in his hands. Uh, so um, the, another purpose of, of uh, the writing of, of Daniel is to show by example, Daniel's example, his his friend's example, uh, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, their example of how to uh, react, how to live, how to overcome when you're faced with difficulties. Certainly, they were they were uh, faced with some difficulties. Uh, can, if you can imagine, if you think back to when you were. Uh, 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 14 or 15 years old, and uh, um, one of the one of the first things that happens to you is that uh, um, they take you and uh, uh, all they take all of the young men and they damage them. They become uh, they become eunuchs, and uh, so that would uh, that would have been a uh, horrific. Thing and uh, you know they uh, there is speculation that yes Daniel was was uh, in that uh, that position it was very very common uh, back in those days for that to uh, that to happen so um, so Daniel uh, his purpose was to encourage to show people that God is in control and then also act in as as an example of uh, how to live uh, when you're faced with, uh, with difficulty. Now, um, I did want to show you there. Here's a, here's a kind of a timeline that uh, shows, you know, the dates and some of the, the areas that, uh, uh, you know, the events, because um, we see, uh, let me kind of point some of these out to you. Um, that um, let's see, why is this not doing? Okay, there we go. Um, Solomon dies. At, when when Solomon died, the kingdom was split, and uh, Rehoboam went one way, Jeroboam went the other way, and uh, um, we even uh, we stood up at the at the uh, temple that they had in uh, Dan where um, um, Rehoboam had set up his his uh, headquarters 
or his capital for the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, what they did is they tried to mimic um, everything that had been done down in Jerusalem. They had a they had an altar um, and they um, they had a, a kind of a temple. The foundation for that temple is, of course, still there. And um, um, there was a not a reproduction of the altar, but a uh, uh, it was a metallic outline of what the altar, you know, the size of it and where it would have been, uh, that kind of, so that it would kind of give you a, a feel for uh, what was up there. But you know, we know that God said you're only supposed to do the sacrifices where I place my name, and that was, of course, was on Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount in in Jerusalem. So. Uh, these northern kingdoms, they, uh, they go along for a couple of hundred years, and then um, Syria comes in, and um, they conquer uh, the northern kingdom, Israel, and they, they, uh, they fall, and they take uh, hostages uh, away from uh, the land. And, uh, now, you know, they, they don't take everybody because... Uh, we know that uh, they left some people, the uneducated, the farmers, the, uh, um, the, some of the laborers and so forth. They left them in the land because then later on, uh, these people, um, as the Assyrians repopulated the land and the Babylonians after them, that uh, they uh, intermingled with the, uh, the uh, Jewish population uh, from the northern kingdoms uh, in the areas of, uh, of Samaria. And so that's why, why you see uh, Samaria has a, is very similar to Judaism. Their, their practice of Judaism was, was uh, very similar, but their, their holy mountain was Mount uh, Gerizim, and uh, they, they had a few different traditions. And uh, because it was a diluted uh, and... Uh, the Jews thought a polluted um, a group of people. They were, you know, half breeds and and uh, other uh, other unfortunate monikers that uh, that they uh, applied to the Sumerians. Uh, that um, these, uh, you know, we know that that the Assyrians did not take everyone out of the out of the land. Um, now the uh, it was about, oh, I guess, you know, somewhere around uh, 50, 60 years, uh, 70 years, something like that, after uh, Israel falls, then Babylon comes in and uh, 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 Jerusalem falls and uh, uh, they go into exile. Now, one thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, there's been a lot of, of stuff coming out um, right now. Um, on the um, uh, two house movement, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a movement within the fringes of Messianic Judaism that talk about that says that um, that if you come to faith in Yeshua, you're saved, you're a believer, then you are then not just grafted in. You are Jewish because you are part of the lost tribes of Israel because. God is only calling Israel, and um, that you just you just didn't know that you were Jewish, but uh, because um, uh, you were saved, then that that must mean that you're uh, part of the lost tribes of Israel. And uh, they said, well, the the tribes were all totally lost. Uh, well, that's not really true because in in this time period where you know it says right here, Judah alone. Uh, the kings of the north were not entirely successful with getting the uh, the people of the northern kingdom to uh, isolate themselves from the from Jerusalem and from the uh, mainstream uh, worship of uh, of God. Um, you know, dur during this this time where. Uh, um, the, you know, it's actually this two, almost 200 years there. Um, so what it, what that meant was there were a lot of the tribes and uh, representatives of the tribes, uh, clans and families 
they moved on south and into the area of Judah and lived there. So, you know, we, we have things where uh, you know, later on the Apostle Paul uh, says that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, now if, the, if, the, if the tribes had been lost, how would he know that he had been from the tribe of Benjamin? So the tribes were not lost. Um, and we, we still don't know, you know, today, um, who's who and in, in what, uh, in what lineage and so forth, but God knows he'll sort it out someday. But, uh, the, uh, the idea that if you're, uh, if you are saved and then you are then, uh, Israelite or Jewish, uh, there's no, no place in the Bible where it says that God changes your DNA uh, when you, uh, when you get saved. All right. Uh, when you, when you accept Yeshua, your, your DNA stays the same, uh, so that, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the Aborigine, uh, in, uh, in Australia, uh, or the Hutus in Africa or something, they don't, uh, magically, uh, become a, a Jewish guy. Uh, just because uh, they accepted Yeshua as a, as their Messiah, they are grafted into the Commonwealth. It would be like um, um, it would be like a, an Australian uh, kid, uh, someone being born in Australia, trying to claim British citizenship uh, because. He's part of the Commonwealth of Great Britain. Uh, an Australian is not a British, an Englishman. An Australian is not an Englishman. They will be quick to tell you that they are not Englishmen. Same with the Scottish. Um, and, uh, uh, and certainly the Irish, right, Michael? Okay. The uh, Irish are not Englishmen. And uh, uh, Scottish are not Englishmen. Uh, but they are part of the, uh, are now or were part of the, uh, the British Commonwealth or part of the British Empire. It did not make them English, though. Uh, 